Thank you very much. I really appreciate the invitation to be a part of this great conference that's focusing on the great diversity within a global context and the importance of children within that context. When co commenting about enslaved children decades ago, the esteemed historian Willie Lee Rose wrote, the disturbing truth is that we know less than we ought to know about childhood and slavery. Despite the significant significance sociologists, psychologists attribute to experiences of infancy and youth and development of personality. During the intervening years since Rose's observation, there has been an abundance of scholarship about the formative years of enslaved boys and girls, and it's readily available and current readers know that there's more information about these children's fears, tragedies, triumphs, and dreams than ever before. It is also evident that the world and the lives of enslaved and emancipated children were interconnected to the extent that few, if any, free-born and emancipated children did not know someone or did not have a friend who remained enslaved. This presentation focuses on the interconnectedness of African children and their kinfolk in America. It attempts to answer questions about how and when children learned of legal differences among themselves and their contemporaries, black and white. It also promises to examine how children grappled with the interconnected worlds of slavery and freedom, especially in states where gradual abolition laws promise liberty to children born after a specific date, but their parents and older siblings remained enslaved. This presentation will also consider the question, what inroads did stressors associated with slavery and uneven opportunities for freedom make upon the physical growth and mental development of black boys and girls in 19th century North America? As a matter of full disclosure, when I initially thought of studying enslaved children in the fall of 1982, I had not formulated such questions, nor had I set out to answer them. Instead, I was a member of the faculty and the Department of History at Hampton University, and I was teaching a course in African American history, and it required the students to write a short 10 or 15 page paper of their choice, but with my approval. One student, Katrina Miller, could not, would not formulate a research problem. During an office visit, I asked her to consider writing about the hairstyles of black women. That had no appeal. Another time, I suggested that she write about foods and food preparations by African Americans. She was not interested. As the semester progressed and she had no research proposal, I asked her to write about something that I had thought about but never took the time to do, and that was about enslaved children. Ms. Miller accepted the assignment, complained repeatedly about the lack of sources, yet she included the autobiographical works of Frederick Douglass, William Wells Brown, and Harriet Jacob in her October 8, 1982 work in bibliography. At some point during the semester, we agreed that she was fill in the spaces with novels such as Jubilee. Jubilee had been written by one of my undergraduate professors and I also asked her to look at Alex Haley's roots. Now, Margaret Walker would not have appreciated me asking the student to look at Alex Haley's roots because she had accused him of plagiarizing from her. During the semester, John, Ho uh, during the semester, John W. Blassingame visited our class. I don't remember if we talked about enslaved children or not, but to be sure, the slave community was one of my students' major sources. At the end of the term, I read Ms. Miller's paper. I complimented her on a job well done and suggested that she send the paper to John Blassingame for a critical review. I also told her about my continued interest in enslaved children and asked her if she could work with me. After the final examination, I never saw or heard from Ms. Miller again. Her paper, Lifestyles of Slave Children in Historical and Fictional Works, 
dated December 8, 1982, remains in my possession. Once I began the systematic research about enslaved children, I, re I repeated the Katrina Miller story to my friend and fellow historian Bob Hall, and he said, you should contact her. You should let her know what she's doing. Otherwise, she may accuse you of stealing her topic. I don't remember if I followed his suggestion or not. Nevertheless, Stolen Childhood first appeared in 1995, and it focused almost exclusively on the 19th century South. The second edition, which is twice the original size due to its expansion in both the periods, period of time and the geographical region considered, appeared in 2011. After 34 years and two books, I have yet to receive a comment or a compliment or a complaint from Ms. Miller. So I stand here today to say she was a catalyst for me to continue with a thought that I had. And I appreciate her helping me to find my passion. Over time, I've learned much about the interconnected lives of African children and their kinfolk in North America from the time they were introduced in the 17th century to emancipation after the Civil War. These children, whether they were male or female, lived in southern agricultural households. They lived in Midwestern towns, and they lived in eastern seaports. If they were enslaved, their lives and their experiences were not monolithic. Neither were their lives and experiences monolithic if they were emancipated. And it has become increasingly clear that slavery and freedom were more interconnected than we initially had believed. The interconnected worlds of African and African descended children in America in terms of what they brought with them and what they left behind received critical attention in Melville Hertzkowitz's 1941 publication, The Myth of the Negro Past, which challenged the assertion of historians people like U.B. Phillips, who claimed that slavery had robbed people of their African heritage. Before the 1970s, scholars of slavery followed that line of reasoning and ignored the voices of enslaved people in deference to slave owners. The break in this model came with publications in the 1970s, including Blast and Game Slave Community. It highlighted cultural retentions. Also published in the 1970s was Peter Wood's Black Majority. It illuminated the linkages between growing rice in Africa and growing rice in South Carolina. Even a cursory glance at personal rec recollections indicate that memories of persons left behind in Africa remained with those who were transported to the Americas. At length, Africans shared their memories with their offspring and others. Phyllis Wheatley was not unusual in this regard. She was born in Gambia. She was kidnapped and sold when she was less than 10 years of age, and she came to America. She spent her enslavement in a New England household. Although she was not subjected to physical abuses and laborious tasks task associated with plantation slavery, she remained troubled, and she was probably traumatized. As a poet, she wrote, I, young and life, by seeming cruel fate, was snatched from Africa's fancied happy seat. What pains excruciated must molest, what sorrows labor in my parents' breast. Wheatley seemingly consoled herself with religion based upon the reading of her work on being brought from Africa to America, and that was published in 1773. It suggests that mercy had brought her from a pagan land and taught her benighted soul to understand that redemption existed in Christ. Some critics interpret the poem as gratitude for Christian doctrine without looking at another work of Phyllis Wheatley, which is called To the Right Honorable William Earl of Dartmouth. In that work, she explained her love of freedom, and then she asked, and can I then but pray that others never feel tyrannic sway? Come into America and expose them to Christianity were significant, but they never eradicated the pain associated with being kidnapped, separated from her loved ones, and enslaved. 
During the Revolutionary War, some colonists argued that England was enslaving them. Within such an environment, few could ignore the dis disjuncture between the enslavement of Africans and the natural rights ideology. Phyllis Wheatley was aware of that conflict, and she wrote, in every breast, God has implanted a principle which we call love of freedom. It is impatient of oppression and pants for delivery. Fond memories remained in the distant past, so fond memories would go into the distant past of African children as they faced uncertain futures in America where they had to learn to be children and they also had to learn how to be slaves. They were chattel property and perpetuity in selected areas of the United States. There were exceptions. The revolutionary ideology re was responsible for the largest increase in the free population when states north of Delaware either freed slaves or they made provisions for gradual abolition. One of the earliest of the states to become involved in emancipation was Pennsylvania, and that was in 1780. But the bill that was passed in Pennsylvania did not free anyone instantly. Persons born before March 1st, 1780 remained enslaved, while those born afterwards were freed at 21, 28 years of age. You have to ask a question, how free is free if you are free and your people are not free? Between 1777 and 1804, other states adopted similar statutes. In the meantime, children, were destined, des children who were destined to freedom owed service to masters that varied little from enslavement. Despite complications and the tardiness of these gradual abolition laws, Northern slavery did disappear by the time of the Civil War. But there are many questions about that time. What did gradual abolition mean to parents and children born before that specific date? Younger children were destined to freedom, but their parents would be held in slavery. Did they pant for deliverance, as Phyllis Wheatley had suggested? Insight into the question is found in the autobiography of the Connecticut-born James Mars. The state's gradual abolition laws freed children born after March 1, 18. 1784 when they were 25 years of age. He wrote, I wonder sometime why I was no more content than I was, and then I wondered why I was as content as I had been. He began a term of service September 12, 1798. He was only eight years of age. His period of contentment was early on, but as he came of age, he began to understand differences in himself and his contemporaries. He became aggrieved. The moment of truth was when he learned that white boys and his own brother, whose service began the same day, were going to be free at 21 rather than 28 years of age. Mars objected, eventually, and he complained. Eventually, three arbiters in the dispute between Mars and the person to whom he owed service said that Mars would need to pay $90 and then he could be free. He could work out the $90. Mars refused and said that his term of service had ended. And he, like Sojourner Truth, probably simply walked away. Enough was enough. Mars was free like his brothers, but by that time his childhood was in the distant past and the older loved ones and his parents probably remained in slavery. There are recent books available such as Redemption, song, be, Redemption Songs Beyond the Reach of Freedom and Freedom Papers discuss the complexities of what happened when one member of a family became free and other members of families were remained enslaved. Liberty, emancipation, whatever you call it, was going to be more meaningful when all members, all loved ones, all people were free. The existence of slavery and freedom simultaneously created tensions for those dissatisfied with slavery and who panted for freedom. As long as slavery existed, there was turmoil. There was turmoil. Until liberated, those who were enslaved lived in a state of war. My use of the state of war 
drew complaints from a reviewer in 1997. That person wrote, King's repeated analogy of slavery with war distracts from the impact of her material. The war material that I used had come from the experiences of the people who wrote about their lives as children. Harriet Jacobs, who was the author of Incidents in the Life of a Slave Girl, wrote, the war of my life had begun, and that was when she was 14 years of age, when her owner's father began to harass her sexually. Sojourner Truth used similar language. She said, now the war begun. And she was referring to her job in a household in New York when she did not speak du the Dutch language and she could not understand what she was to do. She was nine years of age. The phrase suggested that the war analogy was not a, a beyond the imagination of slave-born girls in the United States, nor was it alien to other unfree people, regardless of their gender, regardless of their age, when and where they lived. One of the earliest uses of the war analogy appears in Olada Equiano's the Interesting Narrative of the Life of Olado Equiano, which was published in 1789. <clears throat> he wrote, when you make men slaves, you deprive them of half their value. And he added, you set them in your own conduct, an example of fraud and cruelty, and you compel, to live, you compel them to live with you in a state of war. Similar to Equiano's comment is an observation, not by a slave, enslaved person, but by a free person. And that free person was Lucy Stanton. She was an 1850 graduate of Oberlin Collegiate Institute. Is somebody going to Oberlin? Uh, I've just, I just met someone who was living, uh, going to live near Oberlin. Uh, this woman was an 1850 graduate of Oberlin Collegiate Institute, and she wrote, Slavery is a combination of all crimes. It is war. She explained, those who rob their fellow men of home, of liberty, of education, of life, are really at war against them. Both Equiano and Stanton's use of the war analogy removes it from the personal level to a more a larger historical context. It is clear that many enslaved people were willing to fight the battle against slavery as long as the institution lasts. They wanted freedom and they wanted peace. But how could they fight this battle and not become a casualty of war? Critical to the success was learning how to behave as a child and behave as a slave. Such lessons were taught by parents, fictive kin and others who knew the possibilities and consequences of a misstep. When I first submitted the manuscript that became Stolen Childhood to the press, a reader said that I should use the observation of baby Suggs to explain how poignant it was for children to be in danger. Baby Suggs is a fictitious character in Toni Morrison's prize-winning novel. I don't know how many of you have ever read Beloved looking for a particular phrase, but it is a tremendous assignment. I went through Toni Morrison's Beloved and I found the phrase. The fictitious enslaved mother said, it is my job to know what is and to keep them from what I know is terrible. What is terrible? Potentially anything and everything was terrible for these children. But they learned from loved ones and others to avoid what was terrible. How did that work? How did they do it? Bond servants frequently adopted a demeanor of camouflage to camouflage their understanding of what was and what was not acceptable behavior, what could become terrible. They also learned to, de to deliver ostensibly what owners expected, and navigating the narrow course between an owner's expectation and his or her own self-esteem. There was one a former slave who wrote, the only weapon of self-defense that I could use successfully was that of deception. The mask 
a protective device became part and parcel of the, of the demeanor of many enslaved people, regardless of their age. It functioned as protective covering for different inclinations, as explained by one former slave who said, got one mind for the boss to see, got another for what I know is me. These children, who were outsiders, learned to fit in and to adhere to the wishes often of others while maintaining their self-esteem. Kinfolk seized every opportunity. Kinfolk, loved one, anyone who had their best interests at heart, seized every opportunity to teach the children to forge a balance between social courtesies and self-preservation. The urgency of the matter was ever present, whether one was at work or whether one was at leisure. Evening served as special times to educate and entertain these children. And I, it, I talk about children, and I talk about those who were enslaved, but in many, many instances, the lessons that slave children learned carried over into freedom because some of these children would become free before 1865. In the evenings, parents and others gave them lessons. They learned that what goes around comes around. Beauty is only skin deep, and, but love is to the bone. They also learned the blacker the berry, the sweeter the juice. But, and all but a few of these maxims uh, or these sayings cautioned these children against what might be considered as terrible or bad behavior. Additionally, what was terrible was often found was not always found in the workplace. Uh, I'm sorry, what was terrible was often found in the workplace. Frederick Douglass, for example, said, we were worked in all weather. It was never too hot, too cold. It would never rain, blow hail, or snow too hard for us to work in the fields. Work, work, work was scarcely more than the order of the day or of the night. The rigors of the field, Douglas continued, were less tolerable than the field of battle, and the rigors of the field awaited me. Work can rightly be called the thief that stole the, the childhood of youth, youthful enslaved children. And to survive its onslaught, enslaved children began working at early ages, and they continued to work until they filled in for aged workers who were no longer full-time hands in the workplace. The number and variety of gender-specific tasks depended upon the size of the household. Regardless of the job or location, children were sensitized, trained, or taught by others to perform tasks well and to perform them in a timely fashion. For example, many enslaved children worked in to, uh, worm and tobacco in North Carolina and probably in Southern Virginia. Without chemical pesticides, boys and girls remo remove insects by hand and they suffered the consequence if they overlooked any worms. Nancy Williams of Norfolk, Virginia began worming tobacco when she was five or six years of age. And she remembered another girl, Chrissy, who was working on the next row. And Chrissy, she, uh, Nancy said, kept whispering, pick them off, pick them all off. Either Nancy didn't hear or didn't understand. And pretty soon the owner or the overseer came along and took some of the tobacco worms that had been left on the leaves and stuffed them into the child's mouth. That was a lesson. That was a lesson. Simon Stokes, overseer, gave him a choice when he failed to remove all of the worms. The boy would either receive a whipping or he would, eat, he would bite the heads off the worms. Stokes reasoned that the whip was worse. He said that was powerful bad, worse than biting them worms. He said you could bite a lot of them you could bite a right smart of them quick, or a lot of them quickly, and that was all there was to it. But those lashes lasted a long time. To be sure, work was a thief that stole the childhood from enslaved boys and girls, but it was not alone. These children were vulnerable to many different things, and there are many interconnections between others and what happened to them. 
one of the most unusual interconnections found in my study of enslaved children, and this is graphic. It involved two girls, one black and one white. They shared a mean equality in terms of sexual abuse. Their lives became interconnected. And this, uh, it comes from a case called Commonwealth versus Ned, 1859, and it began in Fredericksburg, Virginia. And it defies, it, de it defies conventional wisdom in the sense that rape as a word has been raced and gendered, or defined by color and sex to the extent that many imagine black males sexually abusing white, male, white females without thinking that white males were I'm sorry, while thinking that white males were solely responsible for the sexual violation of black females. Added to this rendering of the crime, it is commonly believed that black men were executed legally and illegally for abusing white women while males, regardless of color, went public, unpunished for the violation of black females who were assumed to be promiscuous and did not object to illicit sex. One aspect of this case involves Betty Gordon. Betty was a slave. She, along with Virginia Gordon, her aunt, testified as witnesses for the Commonwealth of Virginia. The second facet of the case illuminates charges filed against Ned, a 50-year-old enslaved groundskeeper at a local cemetery in Virginia and that was filed on behalf of Eunice Thompson, a white girl. Both she and her mother, Jane Thompson, testified as witnesses for the state. So you have a black woman who's enslaved, a black child who's enslaved, who testifies against this man who violated the child. You have a white woman and her daughter who testifies. Following Ned's May 17, 1859 arrest, Betty told how Ned, a man she knew, had promised to give her some flowers. He encouraged her to enter the cemetery where he worked. And he also said he was going to buy her some biscuits. And when I talk about buying biscuits to my students, they say, why, why biscuits? I said, think about Lorna Dunes, think about shortbreads, think about Walker's shortbread. He told her he'd buy her some buy biscuits, and he said there were some pretty little marking birds inside the cemetery. Her cultural background, which required deference to elders, may have influenced her decision to follow him. Once hidden from public view, Betty testified, he threw me down, he pulled up my clothes, he got on top of me. He had hair on his be belly. Betty described the assault. She said, it hurt me very badly. And she said, it hurt me in the place there from where I make water. Once he had lured her into the cemetery, he threatened to kill her. He said if she made a noise, he was going to cut her head off, bury it, and the worms would eat her up. He frightened her, and he told her she must not tell anyone. Ned's demand for silence created a dilemma for Betty. Virginia Gordon routinely sent the child to a nearby spring several times a day. It required her to pass the cemetery. If she refused to obey Aunt Virginia, she would have to tell why, but Ned had threatened to kill her if he, she exposed him. However, if she obeyed, Betty was vulnerable to further abuse. She kept quiet, she fetched water, and she fell prey to Ned three times. Virginia noticed a change in the child's behavior, and she eventually learned the cause and assured Betty that Ned would not hurt her. Virginia confronted Ned, he denied the charges, and Virginia wasn't quite sure what to make of this, but there was no need for her to continue to ponder Betty's allegations because Eunice Thompson was able to say exactly what had happened. It is not clear if Betty and Eunice were friends, if they were interconnected in some way. I do not know if Eunice was a mere passerby or if Betty had invited her to come along with her as protection. But in any case, Ned assaulted the two children. And the testimony, as I said before, is very graphic, but it, it's in the record. Eunice said, he took us behind the vault and threw us down and did something bad to us. 
he threw Betty down first. And she describes that assault. And then she says afterwards, he threw her down and did something bad to her. In this case, because of the interconnection, you have a person being violated and you have an eyewitness. Eunice's testimony differs from Betty, in, but they were bound together by this traumatic experience. Jane Thompson and Virginia Gordon shared the disturbing incidents of what had happened to their children. The women's actions run counter to receive wisdom in two ways. First, receive wisdom suggests that slaves like Virginia Gordon could not and did not seek legal redress against other slaves. It's like, if you're a slave, it's okay. Second, Jane Thompson's behavior defies the stereotypical rendering of Southern white women, supposedly who knew but ignored the sexual battering of enslaved women. The women's behavior may not be representative but there's nothing unusual about them seeking justice for loved ones who had been violated physically and psychologically. Both Jane Thompson and Virginia Gordon sought warrants for the arrest, indictment, and prosecution of a sexual predator. The question then becomes, how did they know what to do? Who helped them? Here's a slave woman going to the court to ask for justice. Under the law, the assault upon Eunice was sufficient to convict Ned without considering Betty. Yet, there would be an indictment, deposition from eyewitnesses, a jury was summonsed, and the cases were treated as if there was a genuine interest in the pursuit of justice. Cases were a bit different in terms of the initial description. Ned was charged with an attempt to commit rape on Eunice, an attempt, and he was charged with violating Betty. The attempt was more at saving the white girl's reputation in the future. Despite the differences, the officials combined the cases and they were permanently interconnected. They combined the cases and they heard it as Commonwealth versus Ned, there were no differences. The jury found Ned guilty and he was hanged for the sexual abuse of two females under 12 years of age. Betty Gordon was six years old and Eunice Thompson was nine. Their lives came together. I don't know what happened to them afterwards. Many interactions and linkages between enslaved and white children were not as graphic or as violent. Yet, and when I say as violent, the violence is not on part of the child, but the violence is on the part of the person who, who violated her. You have many interactions of white and black children playing together. Sometimes they get along very well, sometimes they do not. In one instance, it became clear that when a nine-year-old boy played with his 10-year-old owner, then the enslaved boy would ask, Master, will you give me a white man's chance? And his master agreed. And his master said he lived up to the contract, although sometimes the consequences were damaging. Just as black and white just as white and black children recognize differences in their legal, economic, and social status, there were enslaved and free children who also recognized that there were differences. There are wonderful stories and letters that were written by free black children in New York and in Cincinnati, and they were aware of what was happening to their enslaved counterparts in, in the South. There was a verse written by a 12-year-old boy, and it asked, can we not feel a brother's woe relieve the wants he undergoes, snatch him from slavery's cruel smart, and to him freedom, joy, impart. These children were weak. There was little that they could actually do in terms of bringing slavery to an end, but they were very much aware of what was happening 
to enslaved children and others. And as I said at the very beginning, it was very, very few, <clears throat> it was very few free children or free children who did not have a relative or a friend who remained in slavery. Based upon the anecdotal evidence that I had come across in the research over the years, I had said that slavery made children old before their time. And I'd stayed on task, and I was quite delighted in April 2012 when there was a story in the USA Today which cited an article in Molecular Psychiatry. And it said, and this was based on a longitudinal study of contemporary children who had been exposed to violence. Not only did the study concern itself with the results of violence witnessed firsthand, it went on to talk about what violence did to children and the next generation. It argued that the length of the telomeres and the, and the re repetitive sequences at the end of the linear chromosomes had emerged as a promising new biomarker. So children who were exposed to violence early on had some damages and once they, they had changes in their chromosomes and they would pass them on to others. Enslaved children did not participate in such studies, but if it is applicable now, and historians don't like to do this, to go back in time and say it was applicable then, but it certainly is something for us to think about. As I come to the end of this, <clears throat> I, I will say that when, once I got the invitation to talk about my work, I thought, okay, what is it that I can say? And I, go, I went back and I read Stolen Childhood again, and then I looked at the reviews. And one of the reviews that I could not find was one that was written um, in November of 2000, and, and it appeared in the New York Review of Books, and it, it was written by George Fredrickson. That was five years after Stolen Childhood had appeared. Fredrickson had set out to review Marie Jenkins Swartz's book that was published in 2000, along with several other books. And he began his review by saying, 135 years after its abolition, slavery is still the skeleton in the American closet and explain how recent scholarship questioned old interpretations. Well, I couldn't find that, that particular review, and I then went to the web and to see if I could somehow find it. I couldn't find it in J JSTOR. But in surfing the web, I was quite delighted to find that George Fredrickson's entire review is published in the November 14, 2000 Congressional Record. Okay, that made me happy. <laughs> um, the Honorable John Conyers of Michigan introduced the review essay by Fredrickson on the floor in the House of Representatives. He said it was an article which considers the differences among African Americans and how historians of slavery are talking about how slavery should be remembered. Conyers continued, because of the growing number of legislators who are becoming attracted to this subject and the unresolved questions that swirl around it, this review and other materials that it references continue to eliminate this terrible part of American history. Of growing concern is a challenge that this new information may help us in a constructive way to move forward in a nation that honors diversity rather than le leading to finger pointing and accusations that will continue to divide us. There's a growing hope that the spotlight of truth can lead to constructive solutions and a new appreciation of the significance of a diversity which is uniquely American. The Honorable Conyers was right. One continues to hope that the growing body of scholarship on black children across time and place, along with the opening of the National African American Museum of History and Culture and this, and this conference will do much to reposition that skeleton in the closet. 
It will do much to reposition that skeleton and make slavery and racial tensions in America part of a necessary contemporary conversation that will show how boys and girls, enslaved and free, were among those contributing to the growth and development of the United States as we know it. In all probability, those boys and girls wanted their own boys and girls to become productive citizens who could live as free persons in a nation of peace. Thank you. Yes. Thank you so much. That was very informative, and we have our work cut out for us. Yes. Questions from the floor? Wilma? Yes. Yes. I, you know, sometimes <laughs> slavery is referred to as soul murder. It's what? Soul murder, right? And sometimes it's treated more from a focus on resilience. Yes. And where would you come out in that discussion? Where would I come out? Yeah, based on your research. Okay. Slavery, well, one of the things that I, I, I one, of, okay, one of the things that I like to say is that slavery continued for hundreds of years it dealt with millions of people over thousands of miles. It's a big, big, messy subject to deal with. And I do believe that whatever resources you tend to uncover will do much in determining how you interpret this. My book came out in 1995. There were some people who had said, we have gone through the 1970s with the slave community. And slavery, you know, people had their own ways of dealing with things, and there was resistance and whatnot. It was not as, maybe it wasn't as bad as all of that. So where do I come down? I know that resistance was important, but when children resist, they were so very, very weak. Your resistance is going to have to come in other ways. And recently, <clears throat> I, I read something like Redemption Song, um, Freedom Papers, and some of the other r recent books on slavery. And what they show is that people who were involved in fighting against slavery had more help than sometimes we actually believe was there. One group of historians published abolitionists. You know, these are, these are people who are in it for themselves and they're not doing some things right or whatever, whatever. Okay, but now with the legal studies, and if I were 15, 20, 30 years younger, I would go at it in a different direction and look at the legal work that's been being done and how slavery is presented in that way because we, we know about Dred Scott and his suit for freedom, but there were a lot of other cases way before Dred Scott's case went to the Supreme Court. And the real, real challenge is to look at some of those acts of resistance that did not make it to the state Supreme Courts or did not make it to the U.S. Supreme Court. So there is a tremendous amount of work that can be done. And sometimes when I talk about talk about slavery, there are people who will say, well, childhood is a new concept. Why didn't you should compare these children with working class poor children? And I just say as politely as I can, my wick is short. In the words of Edna St. Vincent Bonnet, you know, you burn your candle on both ends. It's, it, it's beautiful, but it's not going to last the night. My wick is short, but if you have some young graduate students who want to do this, I'll be happy to help them. Other questions? Yes. Thank you so much. I hope I can verbalize this accurately and um, convey my question. Um, it's my understanding that slavery existed all throughout the world. Yes. 
And um, up until about four years before the Civil War, the abolitionists, the white man fought for the freedom of the black man and um, even was willing to die for that freedom. And that movement in itself actually helped end slavery in many parts of the world. And in many ways, America, this country, has led the rest of the world in terms of having a greater understanding about the removal of slavery. And so I think may maybe we can feel encouraged by what has happened in this country. So now the next step is, and that's where we need more clarification, I feel, um, and I work with a lot of children, so I'm wondering, one of the talks that I heard was that we need to have um, more of a diversity, uh, understanding of diversity and differences within cultures before we try to bring together more cultures. Mm -hmm. How do we create that sort of understanding of diver diversity and understanding within cultures, meaning the differences that exist, before we try to unite more cultures and more people? Oh my, I, I don't have an answer. I don't, I don't have an answer. But one of the things that you, the United States was one of the, the countries or maybe the only country, I'm not sure, Steve would maybe know this, um, that went through a civil war to abolish slavery. Other countries did it in, in different ways. And I suppose that one of the things that we can always think about in terms of getting at the question that you ask is, okay, what, what do we know? How can we share it? How can we learn more to come up with solutions? Uh, and I started doing, doing the work that led to the publication of Stolen Childhood long ago, well before the internet, well before materials were available. And one of my former professors said, I told him I, I should have done this as a dissertation. He said, oh, there are no sources out there. You couldn't have done that. We wouldn't have approved that. He said it would be looking like, a, look, like looking for a needle in a haystack. My take on that is it was like looking for a needle in a stack of needles. You know, it, it was not easy. So things are easier, they're better today, they're more accessible today. And if you keep asking that question and have enough people involved in the interest to answer it, progress will be made. In the back. Oh, I, first you and then Alan. Thank you. Um, I was thinking about this slavery within this country by bringing labor to take care of the uh, economy here, but there was also slavery within, the, within their own country in Africa yes. because the resources had to be extracted and they needed labor and everything that was good was taken to other places to develop their economies. Since the arrival of many Africans the first generation Africans coming in here, I was wondering if your research can be expanded by interviewing them to see that it wasn't just in here, but it's like somebody coming to my home and making me work hard and taking everything that I have and then you know, taking it away, making me a slave in my own home. That is also, there is a correlation there. I was wondering if your research can expand to that. Thank you for the question. Um, my background really is in U.S. history. And now that I am retired, I can say in an audience like this that I never had a course in African American history. Okay. My students wouldn't have appreciated that. <laughs> okay. But my background is recent U.S. history. So I, I have not I, I know th some things about slavery in Africa based upon my own reading, but I don't have a fine background of African history. Slavery did indeed exist in Africa, 
there were, but slavery was different in Africa from in the United States in the sense that in Africa it was a condition that you could fall into and out of. In the United States it was in perpetuity. Slavery also continued, uh, slave trading, slave raiding was something that began in Africa and continued over time as, as Europeans, Americans, and others wanted more and more slaves to come into, into the, the, the United States. And one of the things that I've learned over, over the years is that slavery as an old world institution has touched many, many people in many different places. And sometimes, and, but there are differences and sometimes people will ask questions and I thought your question was going to talk about slavery and trafficking today. And there are people who are interested in, in really in the global dimension of slavery. But I am only situated in a very, very small piece of this and do not have, you know, the background to actually answer your question more fully. I'm going to say something, if I may. Sure. Okay. I was just going to say that I think one of the challenges of understanding slavery in America is that how it was done in America has no other model around the world. And I think this is extremely important for all of us, especially in these times in this country, to really delve deep into and understand. Because if we want to keep a discourse going, it's really important to understand the uniqueness of the blight, the scourge, the whatever you want to use of slavery that was done in America. It has not left these shores yet. It is very much alive. And I think it's very different than any of these comparisons. Sorry. That's OK. That's OK. Ellen. I'm uh, currently living in the Southwest and um, have lived among uh, the native people of Navajo, uh, Hopi, Apache. And um, listening to the stories of the elders and knowing what the young people have gone through, I'm interested in comparisons, and especially, like you say, the brain, uh, things that happen in severe suffering that is passed on uh, to future generations. Do you know of any studies that compare um, the situations of the native people with the situations of African American, uh, the slaves and or youth today, uh, because there's definitely, you know, a strand of the suffering and the results of suffering and how people are living today. I'd be very interested. Well, in the first edition of Stolen Childhood, I did not talk about owners of enslaved people other than white men and women. When I did, continued to do the research, I found that about 5% or less of Native Americans or American Indians owned enslaved people. And you have a small number of African Americans who also owned black people. Students often become somewhat alarmed at the idea of black people owning black people. It's like it's okay for other people to own them, but it's not okay for them to do this. It was an economic system, and people owned each other for economic reasons as well as for other reasons. But I, there, are some, there are some narratives that were collected, uh, and they fall within the purview of the slave narratives that were collected in Oklahoma dealing with people who had been enslaved. But as far as a comparative study, I don't know of one. But there is a woman who does work on, who does work on enslavement by Native Americans. I think her last name is Miles. It's I, and the, it, I can I can give you a citation, perhaps, <laughs> at the end of this presentation. We'll take one more. 
Well, I'm visiting from Williamsburg, Virginia, where slavery for many years was written out of history. Right. Um, it's now, luckily, we have people that are working for Colonial Williamsburg and at the College of William and Mary who are putting it back in. But in your research, um, I'm interested in finding out, like, I imagine that this is, you're continuing to find history that has not been talked about or known before um, in terms of um, unearthing documents and things that, um, I know the Lemon Project, which is a, a project through the College of William Mary that's, um, that is talking about unearthing this information that has since kind of been. Um, as I said early on, I worked at Hampton University, which is located fairly near the College of William and Mary and Colonial Williamsburg. One of my colleagues at that time was Rex Ellis. He was in the Department of uh, Speech and Drama or something like that. And he began to work with people at Colonial Williamsburg and he developed something that was called the Other Half Tour. And I don't know what has happened with that over, over the years, but he has maintained an interest. And one of the things that I see happening, I don't know what's happening, you know, specifically with, at Williamsburg anymore, but one of the things that I do see is happening, there are various colleges and universities around the, in the United States, and Brown University was pretty much out front with recognizing and paying attention to its interconnections with, with the institution of slavery. Once uh, an African-American woman was selected as president, she got questions, how will you deal with Brown University's past as an African-American or whatever, whatever. She said, you speak truth to power, and she had a commission where people, uh, an organization where people looked at the records and they have made them public. And uh, George, is it Georgetown? Georgetown? Georgetown University also has begun to examine. So there are many different kinds of things that are happening, and documents are not as difficult to find as they used to be. Thank you so Thank you much, very much for this I wonderful presentation. Thank you.